Yo, uh, do you guys know what I'm just I mean, I fucking love Undertale. Like, Undertale is so freaking epic. Like, okay. Yo, what's up, Lex fans? We're gonna check out the new green screen. It's awesome. The next one. Alright, all jokes aside. So, uh, a few years back, Toby Fox created a Kickstarter for Undertale with a $5,000 goal. In a short amount of time, it hit 51000 obviously making the budget much bigger, which gave it a chance to have more content than Toby originally planned. Hmm. Fast forward to the future, Undertale dropped September 15th, 2015, and then, well, boot the fuck up. With the fortune Toby was earning, the game, the fame of the game constantly going up in relevancy, and fans pouring in, everything seemed great. But, as I mentioned, the fans grew a gigantic fandom. But the fandom not only brings in good things, but also a negative side. And with the negative side of fandom, brings controversy. This is Undertale, three years later. So the game starts off pretty slow. Not the most ideal of beginnings in my opinion, since on repeated playthroughs I found myself wanting to skip it regardless of what ending I was aiming for. Not to mention that taking the genocide path will have you stuck on the first area for way longer than you have to be unless you get lucky with the encounter rate, which slows down based on how many monsters you kill in that same area. You wake up after a prologue is laid out as the character Frisk, or whatever you chose to name the main character I guess, as you recover from falling down a mysterious crack onto a a mound of shrubbery. Your first encounter is with Flowey, and despite what I said earlier about the opening being tedious, I actually like this encounter a lot. Flowey's dialogue can change based on whether you choose to take his advice and touch the friendliness pellets, or stay ahead of the curve by avoiding them, to which he acknowledges that you, the player, seem to already know what's going on. Now I'm not gonna claim that fourth wall breaks like that are anything new. But the way it's done in Undertale, whilst not clever by any means, still comes off as charming, such as Sans acknowledging his strange ability to phase between areas, or Papyrus referencing items that you have equipped. It does wear thin after a while though, especially when you find out that certain characters are aware of the concept of their own life bar, and loading saves, and all that business. The rest of the opening isn't really worth talking about since it's pretty monotonous within of itself. I don't think there's much point in going beat by beat through the rest of the story since since I think that everyone knows what it is at this point. The main catch of Undertale was its gameplay, and boy was it... Eh, okay I guess. It's a weird blend of interactive turn-based combat interlaced with sections of bullet hell type attacks where you have to guide a heart, representing the player, through an array of different attacks. Whilst I have to commend Toby for coming up with so many uniquely laid out fights with the final bosses serving as huge satisfying spectacles to witness end game, I can't say it's anything revolutionary unlike some people try to desperately claim. Bullet hell has been around for years and simply meshing it with bog standard RPG elements doesn't magically morph it into some new refreshing take. I found the novelty of it wore thin really quickly, and each fight became more of a case of remembering a sequence of events and how to avoid them through trial and error, as opposed to being an actual test of skill and patience and mastering certain elements of gameplay. This adds to the monotonous nature of the game as a whole. The only thing that drove me to keep playing was the charming characters and my curiosity to find out how they'd react to my choices throughout each playthrough. But hey, turns out that doesn't matter either. This game was definitely made with the ideology of making a statement in mind. You'll find that performing instinctual RPG elements such as grinding puts you on a genocide run or a neutral run based on how many monsters you kill, and if you choose to add the bosses to that body count too. The game doesn't like this one bit, and based on the characters' reactions and endings, you'll find that you're pushed heavily in the direction of taking a pacifist route if you want to maintain affinity with all the characters you came to know and love. This means performing certain dialogue or actions to appease certain monsters as opposed to killing them, again becoming a case of remembering patterns. Yet repeating this process is much more dull due to less player input being applied. It comes off as really preachy that the game pushes you to play it this way, and I wish it would have given me more of a reason to care about the undeveloped and forgettable monsters I slayed throughout the playthrough. If you disregard the preachy nature of it, the game still attempts to keep each playthrough refreshing. The game has a fun value that randomises upon each new game and determines certain character spawns and dialogue boxes. Sometimes you'll find something you never knew existed in previous playthroughs such as the Gaster encounter, along with the grey kids that spout foreboding nonsense. 
come to think of it, I'm not really sure how many times the game is worth replaying since what you get upon each playthrough only changes when you aim for a specific ending. And to do that, you basically already have to know each tedious task you have to undertake to achieve said ending. If you stand on neutral grounds based on what you think of the game, you might as well just watch a silent playthrough of each ending since you'll get just as much enjoyment from watching someone else play it as you would doing it yourself. Plus it saves you from the monotony of repeating boss fights or other particularly tedious sections. In summary, it's far from a bad game, just nothing revolutionary like some people like to believe, and it can be a really slow experience for those not interested in lore and development delivered through dialogue boxes. It almost seems like the killer soundtrack and charming characters immediately equates to it being a good game in a lot of people's minds. I'm not gonna lie though, the characters are pretty charming and each have a unique personality, my personal favourite being Papyrus, so I guess you could say it's worth playing for the compelling and lovable characters. But I found myself with very little motive to repeat playthroughs due to how tedious certain sections of the game were. As for the soundtrack, I'm not gonna touch too much upon that since it's the one thing that everyone can agree is the most brilliant aspect, and that subject has been talked into the ground several times before. Although some bosses have really cool visuals and fights, it still comes off as formulaic regardless of whether you choose pacifist or genocide, so it kind of demeans the game's need for being so preachy about what path you pick. If I had to rate and recommend the game, I'd give it a 6 out of 10, and only recommend it to those patient enough to deal with repetition and formulaic encounters, among with other generic RPG tropes. If not, then just watch a playthrough on YouTube. The controversy that surrounded Undertale whilst it was in its prime was pretty hard to ignore. The ongoing war between the fans and the haters raged on for a long while after the game's release. Guess it's our job to get to the bottom of what caused it. So, where do we start? So, as I mentioned earlier, the game growing a gigantic fan rather quickly, well, it would gain, as also mentioned earlier, a lot of hate and an immense amount of controversy. Let's talk about the conflict between the two sides of the supporters and the haters. Undertale sucks! I hate Undertale! Sh and, uh, don't get me wrong, both have their faults in contributing towards the controversial nature that Undertale unfortunately developed. I mean, you had the haters, people who just disliked it because apparently something getting popular really fast immediately equates to it being overrated, basically the ideology of your local chad. They'd lash out with no rhyme or reason, well, there was a reason, they believed the fans were cringy and all that poorly packed bag of horse shit, then thinking, ah, the fandom is cringy and terrible, that must make the game terrible too, which led some people who were just trying to like something to withdraw from expressing themselves, and some people who enjoyed the game to hide the fact that they did. Yeah, you right gamer, you right. However, the fans aren't exactly spotless themselves. Conflicts always have two sides, and due to how much hate was getting thrown at Undertale, it was only a matter of time till fans started striking back. Sometimes it wasn't always in self-defense though. Undertale had a tiny bit of positive bias going towards it due to some fans adopting the sheep mentality. What I mean by this is they'd blindly eat up whatever their internet idols would say about the game, and along with this came a minor case of there's a right way to play the game syndrome. For example, Markiplier jumped on the Undertale bandwagon pretty late compared to some of the YouTubers, however I'm sure he didn't expect that he'd have to cancel the series after two episodes, Mark wanting to do a genocide route, but then he started receiving multiple complaints due to the fact that people wanted him to play the game their way. This led to him being harassed for certain choices he made in the playthrough, some complaints being as petty as criticising the redneck voice he used for Sans. This led to a certain subsection of fans being labelled as bullies, not a good way to represent the game that you claim to love so much. I don't want to rub it in, because everyone's gonna hate me, but I despise Undertale. The people who actually play Undertale, they're like, playing video games now! Seriously, don't give an Undertale fan a, a piece of paper and a pencil. You're gonna regret every line you ever made. Also, Undertale created
This too adds to the point where I said that people connected the game itself to the fandom, thinking that if the fandom shit, the game is too, which is another factor that added to the game's somewhat irrelevancy today. Hey, you guys. Yes, Mr. Spider-Man. The Undertale fandom basically had every element of what you'd usually find in the fanbase of a popular piece of media. Like we talked about, there's a good side and a bad side. The good side being the ones who choose to quietly like the game for what it is without seeing it in a biased way. You know, accepting critiques and simply just enjoying the game for what it is. And then there's the bad side. In a sense, you could sort of relate this subsection to the Rick and Morty fandom. These are the people who think their opinions reign supreme, and that there's a right way to play the game. They make bold statements about how good the game is, even exaggerating so much that what they claim simply becomes untrue. They basically develop a minor superiority complex. These people worship the game as a god, and any criticisms, even fair ones, are completely void in their minds. Every fandom has these types of people, so it's no fault of the developers or even the game itself. Hell, I'm not even a massive fan of the game, but I can still admit that there are plenty of things to praise. I guess it's just a case of not crossing the line into bias. So, Undertale was truly something. A good game with a nice soundtrack, but nothing revolutionary. Follow the controversy in a somewhat questionable fandom. Like it? That's cool. Hate it? That's cool too. It's your cup of tea, and I am here to change your opinion. Neither is Fracla. So, this was Undertale, three years later. <laughs> Hey, 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 hey,